right, it's official. We have the candles lit. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. Um, glad you muddled out through this cold weather. Let's all stand. Let's begin our worship. How's that? <coughs>
mean something or want something or what, just to praise Him. Amen. Amen. Good singing. You may be seated. So glad that you are here with us today. I do have a few quick announcements for you as we get going. So if, you, if these pertain to you, listen up. If they don't, you can take a little nap. Sound good? Okay. Next week, I know we're all super excited about this because everyone loves business meetings. We have our annual church business meeting after service next week. Anyone can come and stay. You can come right in. We'll probably have it right down here. After service, we'll, we'll dismiss, and then we'll come back. You'll hear some, or we'll pass out. We won't necessarily hear, but we'll be able to pass out some of the um, annual reports from different department heads and things. And, and anything is open for discussion. Not that there ever is any, but hey, if you have any questions, that would be a time to ask it. But anyone is invited to come. You must be a member to vote on anything, and you must be 15 years old or older and a member to vote. Make sense? But anyone is welcome. And I know everyone's like, business meeting, yes! Yay. Okay. Speaking of business meeting, church leadership team meeting is this Wednesday, 6 o'clock down at the Parsonage. And all the church leadership team said, Yay. yeah. Uh. yeah. <laughs> there will be food involved in that one, amen, guys? And, all, and you'll see up here, this will be up here this week and next week. We have the alabaster offering box right here. We just ask, hey, if God wants you to put some money in there, put money in there. Where does that money go, you may ask. 100% of this money that is in that box will go to the mission field all over the world. And that money is used to build things. That's why we got a picture of, 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 of uh, bricks and shovels and things like that on that box. It goes to build churches. It goes to build parsonages, to build hospitals to build schools, anything that is that the Nazarene Church touches, which we are in well over 160 world areas. We are a global denomination. And so in those areas that need help, Alabaster is able to do that and to support those oh, wherever they may be. Our tithe and offering box is in the back underneath the clock, as always. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your giving. And guess what? Because of your generosity, this church, Williamsburg Church of Nazareth, because of your giving generosity, we are sponsoring a Little League team right here in Williamsburg this year. Woo Somebody should get excited about that, right? Yeah, that's going to be good. There's going to be kids running around with, with our logo uh, and, and, and on their shirt and adults on their shirt, and we get to love on them and just, uh, just pray for them that maybe through all of this that, hey, someone will come to know Jesus, and a cherry on the cake would be if they came to this church, right? But if they come to know Jesus, that's the number one. Amen, church? Amen. But thank you for giving. Because you give generously and sacrificially, we are able to do those things like that. Once again, check the final draft of the 2024 church directory. is right here on the music stand you see right over there. If you have not checked that, be sure to check that today after service. To put a check mark if all the information is correct. There's, there's an ink pen there. You can write the information down if it needs to be changed. But we do appreciate that. There's going to be a meeting. And man, we love meetings. <laughs> no, we don't, but we have to have them sometimes. Easter is coming up. Can you believe that? Easter is early this year. I think it's the last last Sunday of March, I believe. It's getting warm. Uh, it'll get warm. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be nice. But hey, we want to have a quick, uh, just a quick information meeting. If you want, it won't last long. Basically, what we want to say, hey, if you are saying, hey, I would like to volunteer for a huge ministry that we do at this church during our extravaganza. Our extravaganza is the Easter weekend. We have, I don't know, we're up to around, I don't know, 2,500 eggs that we stuff. And, you know, last year we gave away 50 pizzas to families and we had close to 100 kids out here. And that's what we want to do again. And that's a big thing. It's a big ask. So if you are willing to volunteer for part of it, all of it, any of it, come and meet right down here after service today. We're just having a very quick meeting just so we know who is interested. Everybody should have a connection card in your worship folder. You should have a connection card. Get that out if you would please and fill out all the information there and don't forget to put down your prayer request because we want to pray with you. We want to pray for you as well. So I'm going to write down my information real quick and you all do that right now because we're going to get ready to collect those. And we thank you so much for doing that. And also, uh, once again, it helps us keep attendance and that kind of thing as well. But we want, we want the, the information that you are willing to give us. We will take it. And then we can pray for you with the prayer request as 
well. We'll have Alan go around. He's going to collect those for us today. Thank you, buddy. We appreciate that. You just pass them to the outside if you would like. And Alan will come around. To, Michelle, if you want to collect them outside, that would be perfect. And there's a plate right there. And as I said, some of y'all, some of the regulars here, y'all are doing so good because every week I think I find more in the plate before service even starts. So y'all are doing fantastic. Who are you here for? I hope not me, because I'll disappoint you. I, I'm glad I didn't get an amen on that. Yes, thank you, Lord. <laughs> but we are here for God, aren't we? We are here to worship Him, to just show our appreciation that God is who He is. Amen, church. If you're able, let's stand and we'll have a word of prayer. We'll go back to worshiping through song. Father God, we thank you so much. And Lord, we thank you for who you are. God, as we sing this song to you, Lord, may it resonate on our hearts and may we understand who we are worshiping, who we are singing to today, Father. And may we worship you the way you deserve. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let your praise be your welcome. Let our song be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life we are here for you we are here for you to you our hearts are open nothing here is in us you are our one desire you alone are holy only you are worthy, God. Let your fire fall down. Let our shout be your anthem. Your renown fill the sky. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is in us. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. To you our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, you are worthy, God. Let your fire fall down. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, we welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise, Almighty God of love. Be welcome in this place. Let every heart adore. Let every soul awake. Almighty God of love. Be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise, Almighty God of love. Be welcome in this place. This is 
This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. is my daily bread, your very word spoken to me, and I I'm desperate for you.
may be seated as Darren sings the song. Thank <laughs> you. 
actually the perfect song for today because we're going to be looking at today exactly what Jesus did on the cross and what that means to you and to me. Hey, who wants to be rich? Raise your hand. Come on now, some of y'all need to come up to the altar and repent for lying. <laughs> Amen, that's right. And, and so what we're talking about being rich, we're talking about spiritually being rich, right? In church, and, and if you go, well, I want to get into that, but I was going to say, if you go to church that tells you, if, if you give them money, that God will bless you with more money, then you need to come back to here. Amen? Not saying God won't. He might. But in, in our money moment today, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about, about a money moment. I want to encourage you to make a budget. Not very many people have a budget. Not very many people make a budget. What is a budget? A budget is really like a guardrail. It keeps us from, from spending too much money on something that we don't need to be spending too much money on. Guilty. <laughs> right? We've all been guilty of that. It, it, and it helps us to focus. It helps us to decide where your money goes because it is your money. Say, my money. My money. It is your money that you work hard for. <laughs> Even though God gave you the ability and the talent to, to earn that money, whatever job you may be working at, or, or if, you're, if you're blessed to be, to be retired, what, what, you, what you did before. <laughs> and, and, but God has given you that ability, so... So, but it's your money. God even allows you to spend it the way you want to spend it. Even his word tells you well, how we should do that. But he will give you the free will to do with what you want to do. But you've got to make a budget so you can decide what's important to me. Where should my money go? For us, I know, and, and uh, when I say us, I mean Ellen because she keeps the finances. Amen. Ooh, I'm so glad of that. But, but uh, for us, we even found... Uh, an app we use Chase Bank. I'm not. I'm not plugging them or anything. But there's an app that we can go to that that tells us where the money is being spent, and it's really pretty good. It says you spent this much on fuel. You spent this much on on bills. You spent this much on groceries. You spent this much on eating out. And you're like, oh, we need to eat out less, right? And things like that. But it will tell you where you have spent your money. That is good. Now there's something called it's called Every Dollar App. And so you can write that down if you want, every dollar app, and in about 10 minutes you can build that, and, and you just put in there where your money goes, and then you'll be able to see what you're spending your hard-earned money on. Amen? Amen? Because we want to be rich spiritually, and in that, we, we can look at the Word of God, and He can... And God wants to bless us to where we can manage what he has blessed us with well. And that includes money. Once again, the second most topic that Jesus himself talked about, the number one was the kingdom of God. The number two was money. In church, we don't like to talk about money, do we? Because, because preachers feel like, well, when I get up and talk about, about money, people say, well, all, 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 all I want is your money to be put into the church collection. And I've told you once again, that's between you and God. I want you to be obedient to him. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. If you're ready to move on to the message for the day. I am excited about this message. And, 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 and if we look at the world that we live in, it sure seems like to me anyway that any of the peace missions, any of the, the, the peace treaties, you know, they bring nations together and like, we want peace, we're tired of fighting with each other, let's have a peace peace covenant or peace treaty, they will call it, and, and they will sign up, and it's supposed to bring lasting, everlasting eternal peace to the nations involved. It doesn't work very often, though, does it? As a matter of fact, I read this week, I read this, and I was like, I gotta share this, because this is just too good not to share between 1500 BC to 850 AD, there were around 7,500 peace treaties or peace covenants signed by nations. And in that time, from 1500 BC to 850 AD, not a single one of those lasted over two years. Say peace. peace. We need peace, don't we? Guess what? There's only one peace covenant. 
I will last forever. And that's the covenant from God signed with the blood of his son Jesus. And that's what we're going to be talking about today in Ephesians chapter 2. And I'll, be, I'll have the, the uh, scripture up here on, on the screen, but you can look in your Bible. Ephesians chapter 2 started verse 11 through the end of the chapter 22. Verse 22. But, but this, Paul, he's talking about the greatest peace mission ever. And that's the one that Jesus was on. Jesus brought peace. Say peace. peace. Thank you. That allowed me to get a drink of water. <laughs> but we need peace, don't we? The world needs peace. An everlasting peace. So in this message, in, in this script that we're getting ready to read, we're going to see those three words I talked about in that video that I sent out to you all. We're going to look at separation. We're going to look at unification. And then we are going to, to look, to, actually we're going to look at separation, reconciliation, then unification. We'll look at those three areas and what Jesus did on the cross, what that means for you and for me. And, and it starts with, number one here, we'll look at separation, which is what the Gentiles were. Now remember, in biblical times, there were Jews and Gentiles. Jews were the chosen nation of God. God's chosen people. If you are not a Jew, you are a Gentile. You and I, we would have been Gentiles. That, that, that's who we are because we're not Jewish. Before Jesus, we were separated. Here's what it says in verses 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in human, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time, before Jesus, at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You were without hope. You were without God in the world. Man, aren't you glad for what Jesus done for you? Amen. You see, because in the, in the beginning of this chapter, we talked about it last week, Paul, he's talking about sinners and salvation in general, how, how, how we can all have salvation. And in the last part of this chapter that we're talking about today here, he begins to look at exactly what Jesus did for the Gentiles. Okay? Because the people in the Ephesian church, those in Ephesus who received this letter, guess what? Most of them were Gentiles. And they understood that the Old Testament, they understood that, that in the Old Testament that it was about those who were circumcised or Jews. They were separated. And at this point in time when this letter was written, the Jews, they began to, and, and they were look, kind of looking down on the uncircumcised, on the Gentiles. They had an attitude that God never intended them to have. It was kind of like maybe some of them would walk around, you know, and kind of have a little get up in their step, and they'd be like, we are the chosen people of God, and you are not. <laughs> right? That, that, that may have been what, what was kind of going on here. And they were like, hey, God chose us. The Jews, he, 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 he built us into a massive nation, and here we are. We're God's chosen people. We are special to him. And you, Mr. Gentile, you, Miss Gentile, you are an outsider. You do not belong. You are not God's chosen people, but we are. And they were kind of patting themselves on the back. God never intended it for them to have that type of attitude. You see that since the time that God called Abraham... He made a difference between a Jew and a Gentile. There was a marked difference between the two. The, but he made this difference not so the Jews could boast and say, hey, look at us. We're God's chosen people. But he said, but he made a difference so that the Jews, the, the nation of Israel, so that they could be a blessing and they could help those unbelieving nations out around them. Before Jesus came, the Old Testament times. The Gentiles, they were without many, many things. They were without Christ. In, in Ephesians, the, 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 the town Ephesus where this letter was written to, those people in that church, before they heard about the gospel of Jesus, they didn't know about Jesus. 
Most likely they went down to the temple of Diana and they worshiped their small G God right there. So they were without Jesus. And, and the Gentiles before Christ, they were, were without citizenship. They could not belong to the nation of Israel because they were not Jews. They could come in, but they were not the chosen people of God. That the Gentiles before Jesus, which is you and I, we're without hope, without peace. They long for a message of hope. That's what they wanted more than anything else. But guess what? In all of their small G gods, there was no hope. So we may say to ourselves, how did the Gentiles get in this mess? Well, hang on, man. I want to read it to you here real quick. We'll see how they got in this mess. In Romans chapter 1, Starting with verse 18. Let me pull up here on my phone. Here's what it says right here. This is how the Gentiles, this is how us, us, those who were not Jews, this is how we got into that mess of being separated from God. It says this, verse 18, Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, they have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that the people were without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires. You see, the Bible is not a story about a group of people on earth had all of these small G gods laid out in front of them. And they just went through them one by one until they found the one true God. If we read the Bible in Genesis, we know that God created humans and God walked with Adam and Eve. You see, man knew the one true God in the beginning. But as time went on, sin came into the world and men began to turn their back on the one true God and walk their own way. And they began to walk after what they wanted, their own desires and what their flesh wanted. And in that, generations later, they, they began to, to think this to themselves, something is missing. Do, do you ever feel like you have something missing in your life? There's just something that you just can't feel that void. So they begin to make these images humans, of, of animals, of, of mix, of whatever it may be. And they would worship that idol. So it's not that that man had all these gods laid out in front of him and worked to find the one true God. We started with the one true God, but because sin got in the way, we went on our own. Now we find ourselves in the mess, the Gentiles. Am I making sense? If I make sense, go like this. Okay, good, good, I'm glad. God called the Jews, beginning with Abraham, and I believe we find that in Genesis chapter 12. The reason God called the Jews was that through them, through the Jewish nation, that God might reveal himself as the one true God to all of the other nations around them. That's why God built up the Jewish nation. Israel was to be a light to the world, to the lost, to the Gentiles. Did they do a great job of it all the time? No, they didn't. But that was their purpose. It wasn't so they could run around and say, look at us. We're the chosen people of God. You are not. You over there. We're over here. We're better than you. No, they were supposed to be a light to the world. God calls each one of us, if we're Jesus followers, to be a light to our world. Not so we can say, look at us, look at me. I'm saved and going to heaven and you're not. That 
that's not why God is living in you. God is living in you so you can be a light to those around you. But we see through this, we see how, we see why the Gentiles have been separated. Do we understand that now? If you do, say amen. amen. Okay, okay, I'm going on to number two, if that's okay. If you need more work with number one, holler at me after service and we can definitely do that. So we know why and how the, the Gentiles and the Jews were separated. We get that. Now we're going to look at some reconciliation. Something Jesus brings the two back together. Well, let's look at what God did for the Gentiles. Because what God did for the Gentiles, my friend, is exactly what he did for you and for me. Are we ready to read this? Some of you are all right, so I don't want to get ahead of you. Let's look at verses 13 through 18. I love this, what Paul says. Man, this, this, needs, to get, this needs to get you excited because you, Mr. Miss Gentile, this is about you. But now in Christ Jesus, because now if you're a Jesus follower, Paul says, now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, you who were separated because you went on your own and you could not come back to God because you were not in that Jewish chosen nation. You were outside of it. You could not come back. He says, hey, you who once were far away, guess what? You have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Somebody needs to say amen right there. Amen. Amen. You've been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he, Jesus himself, is our peace. Say peace. peace. That's what this world needs, isn't it? Who has made the two groups, the Jews and the Gentiles, Jesus has made them one, and he destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Hey, hey, Jew, quit saying that, that, that you are chosen and the others are not, so therefore you're better. No, it was never meant to be that way. And Jesus destroyed that wall right there. How did he do that? By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose, the purpose of Jesus, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. Jews and Gentiles were separated. I want to bring you back together and to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. Thus making what? Peace. Thus making? Peace. Come on, one more time. Thus making? Peace. Peace. There we go. And in one body, now we can be together. Jesus reconciled both of them to God through the cross, his death on the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. You are no better than each other. You are all followers of Jesus. You are in the same family if you have Jesus in your heart. He, Jesus, came to preach peace. Say peace. Peace. Peace to those who are far away. Gentile, you are lost without hope in the world. I bring you peace, Jesus says. And, and peace to those who are near. Jew, he, he's saying, you are my chosen people. It's not about following a regulation. It's not about following laws. It's not about following a checklist. It's about having a relationship with God. He says, for through him, through Jesus, we, say we. We, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. I love that, don't you? I love breaking that down. And we see that, but we can see what Jesus, his death on the cross, done for me and for you. And that gets me excited. And Paul has shown us here the greatest peace mission this world has ever seen. Jesus not only reconciled the Jews and Gentiles together. You, could, you are now brothers and sisters in Jesus. He reconciled both to himself. And through him, through Jesus, we can now have access to the Father. That is awesome. I love that, don't you? And Jesus did this by using something that uh, he would call the one body. And that is the church. Jesus said y'all can worship together now. Because the Gentiles were never allowed in the Jewish temple. They could go so far, and that's as far as they could go. You're not a Jew, you can't go in. It's not for you. Jesus broke that barrier. He broke that wall. And he says, you can all now have complete access to the Father, both Jew and Gentile. Amen? Amen. Sin is the great separator in this world, isn't it? Sin separates people apart. Ever since the great fall, ever since Adam and Eve, since they chose to disobey God, sin has come into the world, and we have been 
separated. When sin came into the world and our first parents and Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed God by, by eating of the fruit of the tree that God specifically said, you can have anything you want except that one right there. Don't eat that. They gave into temptation. Sin entered the world. And guess what? They were separated from God. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And we read in the Bible that before long their sons, Cain and Abel, they were separated from each other when Cain killed Abel. The earth was filled with violence. Sin was just everywhere. The only remedy was judgment. So God sent a great flood. But we see even after the flood, people continued to sin against God. People continued to, to leave the one true God, and they would make their own gods as they went out throughout their life. It was then, at that point, that God called Abraham. And through the nation of Israel... Jesus came into the world. And it was the work of Jesus on the cross that destroyed the wall between the Jew and the Gentile. That destroyed that wall between sinners and between God. We can now come together. Once again, God put a difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Why? So that his purpose was accomplished. I want to I want you to be able to, you, Jewish nation, you, chosen people of Israel, God is saying, I want you to become the light to the world. And, and, and through that, Jesus came, who was the light to the world and is the light to the world today. But once that uh, mission was accomplished, there was to be no difference. That's where the early church had to hiccup. Because they had been gone for centuries. They were separate. Now, all of a sudden, we're supposed to do this thing together. You see the radical change here? Because, you see, if you go back into the biblical times right here, the Jews and the Gentiles, man, they were different. They could not have been more different than they were. They were different in their religion. That They were different in their laws. That they were different in their diet and in, in what they ate. They were different in their dress. They were completely different. And then Peter comes to the church and says, guys, you're not going to believe this. God sent me to this place over here, and it was Gentiles. And then I told them about Jesus. And, and they accepted Jesus, and, and the Holy Spirit fell on them, just like it does when the when Holy Spirit falls in our Jewish places. It fell on the Gentiles as well. Some of them were kind of scratching their head going, Oh, how, how does this work again? Is Jesus so great that he could break down that wall, that he could break down that barrier? I mean, the question of the day became, well, let's think about this, because we're Jews and they're not, they're Gentiles, so we're here and they're there. We are on the inside. Those guys are on the outside. We're the chosen people. They're not. So I wonder that they begin to think to themselves, some of the Jews, did, oh, well, maybe God can save them, but maybe the, the Gentile, maybe they should become a Jew first, and then Jesus can save them. That was kind of the question of the day. Has anybody ever told you that you need to straighten up before you go, before you give yourself to God? Some people say that, don't they? I love to tell, tell people, God will meet you right where you are. Right in the mess you've made it yourself. Amen? Amen? He wants you that way so he can change you. But praise God, through, 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 through Peter and through the, the Holy Spirit, the, the Jewish church, they said, you know what? There is no difference. We have access to, to, to God the Father through Jesus. And they said, isn't God so good that he is so strong and he is so sovereign and he is so amazing that even those Gentiles can have access to the Father through the Son? Isn't God good? And they celebrated. That was an amazing day. Why? Because Jesus breaks down barriers. And maybe you didn't hear that. Jesus breaks down walls. Amen? Amen? We just read it. For he himself is our peace, 
who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And it goes on to say, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Man cannot make peace on their own. They had to go through Jesus. Then you can have eternal peace. See how that works? Jesus is our peace. Jesus made peace. We see what the Gentiles were. They were separated. We see now, we see the reconciliation of what God did for the Gentiles. Now that the Jew and the Gentile are together, let's look at this crazy word called unification. Then and let's see what Jews and Gentiles, what are we now? Because now the Gentiles are, and the Jews, they're both walking on brand new ground. This is all brand new back in biblical times. I'd like to be the fly on the wall. Brand new times. This never happened in the history of the world at this time. That, 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 that the Jews were now welcoming the Gentiles into their family. And the Gentiles were welcoming the Jews. into. The, they were no longer Jews or Gentiles. They were just one family in Jesus. What does that mean? How does that look? Well, let's look at this. What the... Verses 19 through 22 say, says this. I love this. I might get excited when I read this, but that's okay. Consequently, Paul says, Jesus follower. If you're a Jesus follower, this belongs to you. He says, consequently, you, my friend, are no longer foreigners and strangers. But guess what? You are fellow citizens with God's people. And you are also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. It is in him, it is in Jesus that the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, in Jesus, get this church, and in him, because this is for you today, and in him, in Jesus, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God's spirit lives. God lives by His Spirit in you. Did, did, did you get that? Did, did you understand that? The Jews and the Gentiles, they are now one nation. They are now one family through faith in Jesus. So you see, through faith in Jesus, we are all brothers and sisters. No matter the color of your skin, no matter where in the world you call home, no matter the language you speak, no matter the number of zeros in your bank account, amen, church? <laughs> amen. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are my brother. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are my sister. Amen? amen. That should make us excited. It makes me excited. Because... God doesn't look at me. He, when, when God looks at me, when God looks at you, guess what? He doesn't really look at you. He looks at Jesus in you. Did anybody get that? God sees Jesus in you when he looks at you. Sometimes we need to let that soak in for just a moment. Way back in the book of Genesis, in the very beginning of the Bible, we see that God, once again, remember, God walked with his people. That, should, that blows my mind right there. God literally walked with his people. Then sin got in the way. And then we read in Exodus that, 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 that God decided to dwell in the tabernacle of his people. But then sin got in the way. And then we see that God dwelt in, in the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8. Then sin got in the way again. We seem to mess things up, don't we? The glory departed. We see that in Ezekiel chapter 10. God's next dwelling place as we go through this was in the body of Jesus. John 1, 14, we love this. The word Jesus, the word that means Jesus, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus came and Jesus was literally God in flesh on this earth. I love that, don't you? And the people, they took Jesus and they nailed him to the cross. Today, my friend, through the Holy Spirit, God dwells 
in his church. Amen. Uh, I'm not talking about the building. I believe God's presence is here in a special way because we gather together. It's not the building, it's the people gathering. You are the church. You are the church. God does not dwell in man-made buildings. Amen? Amen? He doesn't do it. He doesn't dwell in man-made buildings. Church buildings, he doesn't dwell in here. God dwells in the hearts and the lives of the people who follow him, the people who love him. Since the work of Jesus on the cross, guess what? God has decided that the best thing to do, and God is always right, would be to dwell in the hearts of those who love his son Jesus. And we see that right here in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is what? In you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You are not your, If you are a Jesus follower, you do not belong to yourself. You were bought at a price, and that price was steep. You couldn't pay for it. I couldn't pay for it. Only the blood of Jesus on the cross paid for it. It says, therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, now when, the, when the people in Ephesus, when, when, they, when they got their turn to, to read this, it, it would really resonate with them. When you talk about bodies being temples. Because the Jews, they would all automatically think of the great temple of Herod in Jerusalem. A ma uh, just an amazing building. And the, the folks in Ephesus, the Ephesians, they would think about that great temple of, of the small G, God that a lot of people would worship, with the, the temple of Diana. An amazing, beautiful building. Both of those temples were destined to be destroyed. The only temple that is not destroyed is one God dwells in now, which is you and me. Because we, my friend, get to live forever. Yes, our bodies will die out and they will give out and, 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 and you will you will have a, a funeral one day and I know we don't like to talk about it and, and I'm going to have a funeral one day and I don't really want to talk about it, but it's, it's, it's a fact of life. But I will not die because Jesus is with me. So my soul gets to go to heaven and I get to, to live in, in our re eternal reward at that moment. I love what Jesus says to Peter. This is red letters in your Bible. Jesus is talking to Peter. And Jesus says, I, Jesus, will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. My church, he says, which are the people, will never die if you are Jesus' follower. Now, as we look at this second chapter of Ephesus, I love it. It's, it's amazing. We cannot help but give God praise for all that he's done for us. Think about this. Through Jesus, God has raised us from the dead. And he has seated us with Jesus in the heavenly realms. God has reconciled us and set us up to be his temple where he can dwell. We see in the Old Testament where God would dwell. And Jesus came. And Jesus did the work on the cross. And the Holy Spirit came to live in his followers. So I said all that today to ask you a couple questions. If you are a Jesus follower today, are you helping others trust in God? But do you share the good news with others? Do you share the hope that you have in Jesus? Are you telling others about that peace that they can experience in God? Because you see, church, Jesus died to make a way for us to get back into relationship with God. So therefore, you and I, we should live as a Jesus follower. We should live to take this message of hope and salvation to those around us.
Maybe you're not a Jesus follower, whether you're watching online or you're here in the, in the room. Maybe you're not a Jesus follower. And, and that's okay because you are right where you need to be. So I want to ask you a question or two today. Have you personally experienced the grace of God in your life? Have you trusted Jesus and received his eternal gift of eternal life? Let me encourage you today, if you do not quite know, and you're not quite sure of your spiritual position right now, can I encourage you to make the decision for Jesus? That's the best decision you could ever make. No matter what your past looks like, no matter what your family lineage looks like, you can say, hey, Pastor Doug, I'm from the wrong side of the tracks. Well, so was everybody outside of the Jewish nation. The Gentiles were on the wrong side of the tracks. And Jesus broke that wall down to bring them in to the family of God. He can do the same for you today. I'm just going to ask if you would stand with me, if you're able to today. Right where you're at. Allow the Holy Spirit to ask those questions to you. If you're a Jesus follower, are you doing all you can to show that light to others? To share that, that, that hope, that promise, that peace that you have? If you're not a Jesus follower and, and you would like to have some of that peace and some of that hope, hey, today is, is a perfect day to do that. So with everybody just bow your heads and close your eyes. Don't look around, please. I'm just simply going to ask you. If you're a Jesus follower this morning and you know you could do better at sharing the hope you have in Him, I want you to do something brave. Let's just slip your hand up and put it back down. Amen. Amen. Hands all over the room. Amen. Amen. You can put your hands down. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I had my hand up too, just so you know. And let me ask you this, with no one looking around, if you are if you are not currently a Jesus follower, but you would like to have that peace and that hope and that eternal salvation, that free gift. You don't have it right now, but you would like to have it. Would you be so brave, and I'm not going to call you out because I don't do that, but would you just be so brave to, to lift your hand up real quick and put it back down? Anyone in the room that way? Amen, I see that. Anyone else? You're just not quite sure your spiritual position today. Anyone else today? Amen, I see that. Anyone would, if you raise your hand on any one of those, and just about everybody did. You can come down and pray. The altars are always open. This is, once again, this is just a piece of furniture. It's a piece of wood that we call an altar. It's not special. It's just special when you come down here and you meet Jesus in a special way. You can come, you can kneel, you can stand, you can sit on the front row if you'd like. You don't have to. I'm just giving you that opportunity. If anyone here wants to, want to come, that would just allow us to pray for you today for whatever reason. Anyone want to do that today? I just encourage you to come down right now. Anyone? We would we would just love to pray with you and for you. Anyone I want to give you that opportunity today? Absolutely. We'll continue to pray for her. Anyone else want to anyone want, want to come down and just so so we can pray with you? need Jesus, you just simply talk to him. You just got just say a prayer or something like this. Just say, just say, Dear Lord in heaven, I'm a sinner and I need you. I need you to come and forgive me of my sin. I want my spiritual position to be that with Jesus. I believe in you. I believe you forgive me of my sins. Help me to follow you every day of my life. That's a simple prayer. And then if, if you say a simple prayer like that, I want you to come to me after service because we're supposed to tell somebody. And also, I have something for you that will help you in your walk. Let's pray right now. Father God, we come to you, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we, we thank you for this scripture that we read today. It was, it, it, it's 
kind of almost sort of like a history lesson, but Lord, it's so good that we see the work that Jesus did when he came to earth. How, how Father, how your son broke down that wall, that barrier to allow all of us to have access to you. We don't have to go through a high priest. We don't have to go through anything, Lord. We just have to come to you and where we are in a moment. And your word says that your Holy Spirit will live in us. God, may we all be beacons of light as we travel this week. May, may we share your love and your hope and your, your message of salvation and eternal life with those around us, God. Lord, if anyone here today was not sure of their spiritual position, Father, and maybe today they made that decision to make you number one in their life, God, give them the courage to come tell me so I can celebrate with them. Father, we thank you for who you are and all you have done. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Go be Jesus to someone this week. Show them the light and the hope that you have. Hey, if you want to help us with our extravaganza, come right down here. We'll have a very, very quick meeting. Thanks, church. We love you all. God bless you. Artists missed.